This is the first of five videos on what life was like in the 18th century America. Uh, that's the 1700s. In this first one, we'll look at how uh, immigration and agriculture and transportation changed during the 18th century. One way the colonies changed in the 18th century was through increasing non-English immigration. Now, initially in the 17th century, virtually all immigrants were English. They, they had come from England. Obviously, France and Holland had their own colonies. The colonies, it should be noted, remained very English even throughout the 18th century. As a matter of fact, in 1790, when the first U.S. Census was taken, it was estimated that 60% of the people were of English descent. But still, looking at it a different way, this meant that 40% of them were non-English origin. Now, the, immigrant, the immigrants came because the colonies were more firmly established. There was, there was less danger. And also, there was a developing trend towards diversity in the colonies. The English government didn't mind, as long as the people that came agreed to follow the English laws. They recognized that immigration meant that their colony would grow, and thus their own taxes would increase. They actually worried in the 18th century about too much of their English citizens going to their colonies. They needed these workers for their growing number of English factories. It was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And any, if anything, the, by the late 18th century, the English government actually discouraged immigration of its own citizens. In the 18th century, travel across the Atlantic was a thriving business, but it was still hard. But, you know, it, it was definitely better than it was in the 17th century. In the 17th century, when a person left England, they really didn't know how long they'd be aboard the boat going to America. The, uh, the ships were really, really slow and kind of small, and it could take up to six months sometimes. Sometimes ships that left London at the same time might arrive in America as much as eight or nine weeks apart. These small 17th century ships had little lighter air, and often water would pour through the cracks of the deck, drenching passengers and their belongings. There was no bathrooms on board, and if you wanted to wash, you had to wash in the salty water from the sea. Almost everyone wore the same clothes for the entire voyage, so you can imagine what they must have smelled like. Meals usually consisted of salted horse meat or salted lamb, pork, or fish, and hardtack, a, a hard, dry biscuit. There was no ice or refrigeration, of course, and that meant that all meat had to be eaten en route. Uh, was, you know, it was often alive and had to be slaughtered on the, on the boat itself, so there wasn't much room for, the, for those animals, so there wasn't much. There were dried peas and beans and cheese and butter to eat, but it really became too moldy and too bad by the end of the journey. A large amount of water was taken on board, but after standing in barrels for a while, it was neither pleasant nor safe to drink. This is why a lot of rum and beer was consumed, because it was lasted longer and was safer to drink than water. Certainly by the 18th century, the ships were bigger and the transportation was a bit quicker, but it could still take anywhere from six weeks to th even three, four months to cross the Atlantic. A lot of the increase uh, in speed was because they learned how to use the Gulf Stream's current. And uh, also they were able to, uh, they had a, a time piece that now could tell time at sea. So they had a better idea how uh, far they had gone. Uh, they still relied upon the compass and sextant like they did in the 17th century, and they still had no idea of, of the hurricane season, which could be quite dangerous. And just like in the 17th century, disease and sickness could often wipe out an entire crew. The first significant non-English group to arrive, other than a small minority of Dutch in New York or the Swedes in Pennsylvania, were the uh, French Protestants, which were known as Huguenots. Uh, there hadn't been a real Protestant Reformation uh, spreading in, in France, but there were a few Protestants. And these French Huguenots did face discrimination, and so they had a reason to immigrate. And they tended to settle in towns, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Uh, because they had fled for religious reasons, they really weren't necessarily poor. Some of them were prosper mer prosperous merchants or skilled artisans. A lot of them settled around places like R Richmond, Virginia, and, uh, where there's a Huguenot County. 
The next group to arrive were Germans and German-speaking Swiss. What's now Germany was at the time a bunch of different principalities whose rulers often fight for supremacy. The Protestant Reformation had spread quickly in Northern Europe, and if you didn't practice the religion of your particular ruler, you'd find yourself persecuted. Today, you can even see the vestiges of German architecture in America. The Germans tended to build their houses with stone, and they had a fireplace in the middle, which was different than the English homes, which tended to have the fireplace at the uh, end of the building or the side of the building. The first Germans settled in the area of Pennsylvania. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a town not far outside Philadelphia today known as Germantown. And by the end of the colonial period, there are more than 100,000 Germans living in Pennsylvania, almost a third of the population. Increasingly, however, in the 18th century, Germans began migrating to the backwoods of Virginia and North Carolina, the Shenandoah Valley. The next largest non-English group to arrive in America were the Scotch-Irish. In 1790, at the end of the 18th century, they constituted a fourth of a million people, or about 14% of the non-English uh, population. The, the Scotch-Irish were lowland Scots who had first emigrated to Northern Ireland. They were Protestants, however, and found that both their religion uh, alienated people and they had difficulty with uh, you know, getting jobs. And so they first settled in Massachusetts, but the Puritans didn't like them there. So they ended up uh, squatting on vacant frontier lands where they became Indian fighters. The Scotch-Irish were often the uh, leading edge of colonialization into the wilderness. You can see in this uh, slide here, they had even begun to press into what's now uh, eastern Kentucky, Tennessee, and even northern Alabama and Georgia by uh, the end of the 18th century. There were a small amount of Irish Catholics and European Jews who came to the colonies in the colonial period, but their numbers remained small compared to the other immigrants. Jewish people first came to New Amsterdam in the 1650s, and they always tended to stay in cities where they prospered because uh, they were so few they didn't encounter any anti-Semitism that you might expect today. Overall, it should be noted that immigrants either settled in urban areas together or they tended to settle in the backcountry frontier, and this contributed to often east-west tensions. They were seldom assimilating into self-sufficient farms in New England or in the, into the plantation life that would develop in the South. Turning to agriculture, there really wasn't much improvement between the 17th and 18th century. The plow, for example, hadn't changed much for centuries. It uh, was often inefficient and farmers had nothing but wood plows and they'd often break. They were on average lucky to plow one acre a day pulled by a horse. And after plowing, farmers still had probably to use a harrow with wooden teeth to crush the upturned clods of earth. They, uh, there wasn't a lot of plows at that. I mean, only one in six, it's estimated, farmers at the time of the revolution even had a plow. Scythes were used to cut crops, especially grain, at about, I'd say about a three quarters of an acre a day. This was increased in the 18th century with the introduction of a cradle uh, scythe, sort of, if you think of like the communist symbol there. After cutting uh, with the wooden scythe, farmers tied the grain into bundles, which were then dried out and taken to a thresher, a wooden machine which grinded grain with a, a four-foot uh, four handle. So even though farming production increased in the 18th century, it remained remarkably laborious and overall not that much different from the 17th century. Only one new crop was introduced in the 18th century, and that was indigo. Indigo was a plant that was used as a dye. You'd cut it, and then you'd boil it, and you'd dry it, and it could be used to stain and color clothes, and famous for making purple. For the longest time, uh, American farmers in the South couldn't grow, it, grow indigo because it only grew in really hot climates, and it, it just they wouldn't grow in, in the American South. And that changed in the 18th century when a young girl named Eliza Lucas inherited a plantation from her father. And rather 
than get married and let a husband handle it, she said she was going to run the plantation herself. And uh, listening to the slaves on the plantation who had some skill, she figured out how to raise and cultivate indigo where it could be raised in the South. So she introduced this crop to America, and she wasn't even 20 years old. She became sort of a, a, a model of a 18th century feminist. She, a lot of people wanted to marry her, and uh, she resisted marriage opportunities and pretty much ran the plantation herself. She finally got married and became Eliza Lucas Pinckney later on. Unlike agriculture, transportation made significant advances in the 18th century. In the 17th century, the 1600s, colonists avoided land transportation as much as possible. Everyone traveled by water. There were uh, backwoods, you know, away from water areas where you just couldn't access. The only thing resembling roads were often Indian trails that weren't even wide enough for a horse sometimes. The woods were so thick you had no idea of direction and you couldn't see the stars or other landmarks. Colonists learned to, quote, blaze a trail, cutting bark from trees to mark paths and then trying to keep a record. Colonists in the north developed wooden mesh snowshoes, but in summer and in the south, nothing helped with the dust and the mud. Rarely were there ferries, so it was really trouble crossing rivers, and there were few inns as well. In the 18th century, transportation was much improved. Not only were the boats larger, as we've said, but there were improved water depth charts, and uh, lighthouses now had begun to spring up along the American coast. The biggest changes were in the roads. Between large towns, which mostly means in the middle colonies and New England colonies, the colonists cut wider roads capable of handing, handling carriages, and they built inns, which is, of course, a better place to stay than just camping out. By 1760, stagecoach lines began operating in a regular schedule. There were express coaches with no interim stops, which were called flying machines, that could whiz you from New York City to Philadelphia, which was about 90 miles, in only two days at a cost of three pence per mile. Inns were, of course, interesting places. Everyone met there, and uh, they learned of the road ahead and uh, may maybe any news that's traveling around. They were small, having often just one uh, room for men and one room in for women. The picture of the inn here would certainly be one of the larger ones. When uh, the inns became crowded, travelers were often just forced to roll up a blanket on the floor and sleep there. Much of the improvement in land transportation was connected with the growth of the mail service. The English didn't institute any formal mail service in the colonies until 1691, and then it was a uh, private, far-profit business. Before that, ship captains carried letters uh, around the colonies to and from England for a fee, and if no ship was going, there really wasn't any way to get mail sent out. You could have to wait for months. Early in the 18th century, Parliament controlled and funded mail deliveries and began uh, having that route, their, their services extended to towns in the north. Uh, but the south was completely neglected. It extended only to the south after Benjamin Franklin became deputy postmaster general in, in 1753. Soon, by the late 18th century, a system of designated post roads existed with regularly employed post riders who rode day and night. That really cut the time for delivery. For example, uh, before, it could take three weeks to get a letter, letter delivered from Boston to Philadelphia. After the post riders, it took only six days. Still, however, it took ten weeks, even in the late 1700s colonial America, to get a letter from Charleston, South Carolina, to a northern town. By the way, all the mail was paid by the receiver of the mail, COD. Even transportation between the frontier and the seacoast improved during the 18th century. At first, goods were transported on pack horses, tethered together in long trains. Two guys could handle a train of about 15 horses, with one man guiding the lead horse and the other bringing up the rear. By the end of the 18th century, the most popular vehicle, vehicle on the frontier was the Conestoga wagon. These wagons had high, broad wheels with roomy bodies that could carry anywhere between four and six tons of goods. The wagon body was painted in blue and red often and was covered with heavy white cloth supported by six to eight arched looms. 
four to six horses pulled it, depending on how much load you were transporting. And sometimes they traveled in trains of up to 100 wagons. They're kind of like the uh, 18-wheelers of today. Still, I don't want you thinking that travel in the 18th century was easy. Uh, any cost for, say, Conestoga wagons remained very high, and merchants still preferred to ship their goods by sea, which was cheaper. This concludes the first of the four videos on colonial life in the 18th century.